What is going on, mi gente? Welcome back to another episode of Binging Dragons. My name is Ruben, aka Crossroads, and today's episode is an episode that I have been looking forward to for a very, very long time. And yes, if you're wondering, yes, I'm going to address the elephant in the room. I have not recorded an episode in exactly one month, maybe one or two days over, but it's been for a good reason. I have been uh, testing and prepping uh, in order for House of the whenever House of the Dragon season two comes around, or not whenever we know when it's coming out, June 16. Uh, so I've been prepping hard uh, in order to just get ready for the second season and tackle it, and be able also to talk about it and geek out about it uh, with other awesome fellow creators uh, that. A lot of them I have as mutuals now, and I'm so, so excited because you know what that means? I get to ask them if they want to join me on the podcast, just like we are going to do on today's episode. Today's episode, uh, the reason why I say it's really, really special, and it's it's something that, I, that I've been looking forward to for a very long time, is because I have someone that I pretty much, th this is what I think about this person, besides the fact that they're awesome. Uh, it's that they're, just imagine the A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones universe, or multiverse, I would say, but imagine it as a cosplayer. Yes, do that. <laughs> and that is because today I have none other than the awesome Estela graves and Happy. what thank is going on. on yes thank you thank you for that wonderful introduction i feel like i'm so hyped up uh thank you because uh i can't believe i did that on one take uh especially after one month of not recording an episode so i, I was a little bit nervous i'll tell you that but now i am done with the hardest part which is always the introduction <laughs> Exactly. And it's just smooth sailing from here on out. We can just chat. I am so excited to talk House of the Dragon, talk about these new promos, talk about the new season coming out. I'm yep. just, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. Oh, no. Thank you. Thank you for, for accepting my invitation. And I know we, this has been a few weeks in the making, uh, but I'm just so excited to finally be able to do this. Uh, for all of you guys that are uh, watching or listening, I will be putting, and I will have uh, Estela say her, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but you go by her or? She, I, I her, but I, I don't mind a they, them. That's fine. I don't really, you could he, him, me. I'd be a little confused, but you know. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Um so I'm definitely going to be posting uh, her social media links and everything. Uh, but even still, please, Estela, uh, could you please tell us where people can find you before we get into whole discussions of news and whatnot? Uh, because, yes, I want people to find you and your amazing work. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you can find me on most social medias under Estela underscore Graves. Um, that's, you know, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, I think technically Twitter. I think that is what they're all under. It's, you know, it's a little confusing sometimes. But yeah, Estela underscore Graves is where you can find me. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, like I said, I will be putting all of the links in the description of the video. So make sure to go there and uh, follow her on each and every one of them because again, uh, her work is just incredible. It's, Estela is actually, I haven't told her I think, but she's definitely one of my favorite content creators out there in terms of everything, but mostly A Song of Ice and Fire. That's how I found you. Um, I know you do other stuff like Lord of the Rings and and uh, 
Baldur's Gate, maybe? I can't remember. Yeah, Baldur's Gate. I kind of dabble in some Witcher. It's, you know, but it's mostly a song of ice and fire because that's where my heart is and that's where yep. I feel like I'm most knowledgeable, so. Right. And the thing that always kind of drew me to your content uh, was the fact that you opened up a whole new layer of things uh, when it comes to A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones. Um, and that is the costume side of things. And to see how excited you are about talking about uh, costumes, the costume designs, and your cosplay was just something that drew me in. And I know that a lot of you are, you're going to feel attracted to the whole uh, content. So when it comes to your cosplay, and by the way, I will be, I will be sharing with you guys uh, some pictures and I don't, I didn't really get any of the videos, but before I, as I find those pictures, let me ask you how or when did you start the whole journey of cosplaying uh, in general? But then mm -hmm. if you kind of want to work yourself into a song of ice and fire and all that incredible world. Well, I would say my first, I guess, I don't know, does, does Halloween count as cosplaying or is that just dressing up in a costume for Halloween? Yeah. Actually, okay, so the, the non-cosplayer in me who would love now to one day do it will say, yes, it's cosplay. <laughs> but at the same time, yes. Uh, yeah, because... Um, however you feel. I feel like it is. <laughs> yeah, for a COVID cosplay, me and my boyfriend, we dressed up as uh, Arwen and Aragorn in Lord of the Rings. And it was literally like a very COVID-y cosplay. We kind of just threw it together. And I was like, this is fun. And yeah. then I didn't do anything. And then I started making TikToks. And I started getting a lot of um, comments saying that I looked like certain characters in Game of Thrones, like specifically yeah. Shay. Um, Melisandre, uh, etc. And then I came across on Poshmark a Melisandre costume that was like, I want to say it was like 15 or 20 bucks. And I was like, oh, this will be fun content. So I bought it right. and I was like, this is actually really fun to be dressed up in. Um, right. And what was that? No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying, oh, oh. I'm, I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So it was just fun to be dressed up. And then I've always been really passionate about makeup. I really like doing makeup and doing fun makeup looks. And I realized I could kind of manipulate my face to look a little bit like some of these people, even though I don't actually naturally fully look like a lot of these characters. And so people seemed to like that. People thought it was fun. And so it then kind of took me on this journey where I'm now very slowly cosplaying almost every character. Um, right. Jokingly done Jon Snow, jokingly. Oh my God, those like are so good. As, uh, like Olena Tyrell. I keep joking that I'm gonna put on a bald cap and be egg. So it's just a fun <laughs> time. Oh man, I I'm telling you guys, when I say the multiverse, uh, I, I had, a little bit of problems here bringing up the the picture that you sent me so is it okay if i just bring up your instagram that's fine yeah My okay instagram. cool um sure um and uh when i say that stella is literally like a multiversal <laughs> song of ice and fire game of thrones uh living cosplayer or multiverse it's real man because let me i want to make sure that people can see this right now i don't know why it's not bringing it up um another uh, thing i'm like a closet cosplayer um yeah. it's all mostly stuff in my house that i'm just throwing on and throwing together i've actually never been to a con dressed up or anything really um, like, yeah i'd like to go one day um but for now i'm just yeah. in my apartment have you ever have you ever been to a con it's funny i did go to a con um my boyfriend bought the tickets and was like i have a surprise for you and wouldn't tell me what it was until like the day of and I was like, yeah. oh my God, why would you? Because I was like, oh my God, if you told me, I would have like dressed up and done something. I'm glad I dressed like a little bit themed because I had a vague idea right. of what we were doing. And then it turned right. out he got us like a photo op with uh, Elijah Wood and Sean Astin. And I'm like, oh God, what? I'm glad I dressed slightly elvish. Like I'm so yes. happy that I'm not in my sweats. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. Oh man, that's, that's, that's just the dream right there. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um... I mean, but I, I haven't been. I've shown up in a Lord of the Rings costume, but you know, it's fine. It's fine. Right, right. Um, so over here, I managed uh, to pull up 
uh, your Instagram. And for some reason, I don't know what's up with my computer right now. Like I, like I told you, there's always uh, things that happen. Uh, but I managed to at least uh, get a few, you know, of your like Cersei. That one just cracked me up. This is Shira Sea Star, right? Yeah, yeah, Shira Sea Star. And someone did a really lovely little fan art of my cosplay, um, or a, of Shira based off of my cosplay, which I thought was really nice. Yes, yes, it was. Um, I'm going to try again to, okay, I don't know what's wrong with my computer right now, but uh, I will say my favorite, and I will, that kind of leads me into one of my other questions when it comes to your cosplays, but uh, my favorite for sure is Melisandre. I don't know if that's because uh, that's how I found you. Uh, I found you through uh, one of your Melisandre videos and it was just like how <laughs> how can you look so almost exact like melisandra in game of thrones um so yes people like look at this it's, it's crazy a lot of, and your shay is great platform. too so <laughs> thank you what yeah, were you saying I, mean, I said it's a lot of cheek contour and a lot of like kind of contorting my face and giving myself very round eyebrows and um you know, my hair was dyed very red for a while, so that kind of helped too. But. Right, right. Um, which one would you say is your favorite out of the the cosplays that you've done in mm -hmm. Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones? Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, I would I would say it was Melisandra because I just think that's a really fun character. It's hard to pick because I'm very proud of all of them in different ways. Like I made the belts mm -hmm. for cosplay and that was very involved so i'm very proud of that um right. but the Sierra sea star one is such a full transformation because i put on that silver wig and i feel like i don't even recognize myself so i think right. that one is my current favorite just because it's new and it's different so yeah it, that one i don't know a whole lot and i can't wait to at some point i don't know if it'll happen full on in this episode i am hoping that in some other episode we can do like from beginning to end to a song of ice and fire talk uh because i am currently on my third actually no i finished a storm of swords mm -hmm. and uh i i can't wait to find out more about shira uh sea star i have my calendar over there uh song of ice and fire calendar and i believe that was the illustration for last month mm -hmm. and i i'm so so intrigued by her all her like everything that has to do with her character um so yes well she is very enigmatic we don't know a lot about her and i think there's some opportunity well you can talk about this later in the mystery night and in the the night of the seven kingdoms but we might not see her also because you know that story is not really central around her so who knows if we'll see her ever on the screen right uh well whatever i can get from shira <laughs> sea star um i believe they they talk i'm i've got a feeling they talked about her a little bit in uh in a storm of swords isn't she the one that uh not arthur dane was it his father or brother Mm, I think you might be thinking of Ashara Dane. Oh, Ashara Dane. Forget it. Yeah. That. I'll say so. um, I don't think this is too spoilery. You're on, you know, you're oh, no, yeah, yeah. well into the books. Um, yeah. A lot of people theorize that Quaith might be Shiera Sea Star. Okay. Huh. Like, secretly. In the same way that, you know, Blood Raven is clearly the three eyed raven on the other side. Right. The wall, maybe Shiera Sea Star is on the opposite side of the world doing her her thing huh you see this is what i love about a song of ice and fire and it can be for some people it can be the 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 worst thing uh all the theories and this and that because a lot of people get so invested in theories and i do as well but a lot of times um uh, people uh get so invested into these theories that if it doesn't happen they call it you know like bad or just trash and whatever it's like eh, yeah but... say, this is not canon this is fan fiction like that kind of stuff yeah so that is actually that is really really interesting i'm just starting with all the uh kind of 
I'm starting to work my way up when it comes to theories in the books. And I feel like it it's starting to pick up a whole lot with the way things ended in A Storm of Swords. Mm -hmm. Actually, like halfway through Storm of Swords, we start getting these characters uh, like Cold Hands. I'm just now getting into the whole theory of Cold Hands. Uh, I was like, it's obviously Benjen, but then someone told me uh, the Princess of Dragonstone. I think you might know her on on TikTok. Um, shout out Princess of Dragonstone. Uh, she was telling me that a lot of people seem to think that it's the Night's King, and I was like, it like it very well could be. Um, you'd think it would be Benjen, right? You'd think, but there was like a note from George, George's editor that was like, they circled it when they were editing and they said, is this Benjen? And George said, no, not Benjen. So it's some other mysterious person. Oh, shoot, we're we're yeah. yet to find out who it is. That, man, we need wins of winner. I know we, we all say it so much and I, I still got well, two more books left, but. Have you, have you seen all the show? I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah, because in the show they made it Benjen. Yes, that's kind of what I thought. Whenever the, uh, he comes around to save uh, John, uh, I was like, I kind of figured that in the show they did make Cold Hands Benjen, but of, that's all season eight. Uh, yeah, we seven, can talk eight, about that. That's, yes. that's definitely <laughs> one of those changes that was probably a D&D &D creation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but before uh, people we are going to get sidetracked with a song of ice and fire and every time i get the opportunity to sidetrack things for a song of ice and fire talk with estela i'm gonna freaking do it because i still haven't gotten the chance to fully geek or geek out um when it comes to my first read through of a song of ice and fire and I'm just, yeah, I'm I'm gonna take advantage of those of those mo uh, moments. One hundred percent. So you said you're on um, a storm of swords right now. Yes. Yes. So how do you how do you feel so far out of the the three that you've read? What is your favorite of the books? Oh my god, storm! <laughs> I had I had clash. Okay, it's funny. I started off with the first one. It was like, man, this was this was really good. I felt like it was very like I could see the show kind of running in you know in my mind, and uh, but at the same time being able, which this is the incredible thing about the books, uh, being able to be in their minds, and something interesting that I, I tell people, I think I made a video about it back then when I finished the first book. I was like, um, I like Sansa already, <laughs> and I remember in the book in the show. I wasn't like definitely not in the first season. I wasn't a big fan of Sansa. Um, not that I hated her or anything, because I know some people out there are go too far. Um, I just didn't never really like care a whole lot. Obviously, once like the whole thing with Ramsey, which I found out, I heard that supposedly that doesn't really happen in the book. Um Obviously, all of those things horrible, and I I just loved her more and more. Uh, and by the end, uh, I actually liked Sansa. But in the book, I, by the end of the first one, I was I was already a fan of Sansa and her chapters, and it just made me appreciate her so much more and ask myself questions that I never really thought about while watching the show. Uh, which, for example, let's bring up uh lady her dire wolf mm -hmm. like what effects how did uh lady being killed or sacrificed or whatever it is um what effect did that have on sansa mm -hmm. it's like there has to be a big time effect obviously her ability to warg because now we know that every stark is able to warg into their i, I think George said that recently. Um, yeah, he alluded to as much. And so, you know, that leaves it, because we've seen, you know, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but a lot of the Stark yeah. kids are shown in later books to be able to warg. Um, but obviously, if Sansa doesn't have Lady, how is that going to happen for her? Is that going to happen for her? 
we'll have to see. Right. So that was something big. Uh, from reading the uh, the first book, but yes, in general, um, when I went to a Clash of Kings, I was like, "There's no way, there's gonna be a better book than a Clash of Kings," <laughs> and boy, was I wrong! And it's crazy that I was wrong because a Storm of Swords just blew me away. Really, um, I still love a Clash of Kings. I still love Clash, but Storm. I mean, Storm is considered one of the best written fantasy books for a reason. I mean, there's a lot of authors who to this day try to emulate that book and try to emulate that style. It just has really great pacing. All of the chapters are very gripping. I don't know what was in the water when George was writing that one, but it is it is just really, really fabulous. And, you know, people, you know, I think people try to be contrarians and they're like, oh, that one's overrated. And I'm like, I think it's appropriately rated, though. I think it's popular for a reason because it's really, really good. Mm -hmm. it's it has so many elements not that we don't have it in like obviously you start seeing it in book one but the third book uh, storm is definitely that point in where you can tell magic is like you know uh getting going like the whole magical aspect of this world it start has started and obviously we we get a lot of that in clash um and i love the magical aspect of this world um as much as i love the the political and all the the scheming and all of that i'm a big sucker for the the magical aspect uh the the wargs or like the the star kids um i still have my top chapters are like my top, I don't want to say top characters because I feel, I don't know if everyone's like this. I know not everyone is like this, but I feel like I can, I love all these characters almost equally. Just like George says that all of them are like his kids. I legit feel that way. Um, like I can make a case for almost every character. Obviously <laughs> there's, the obvious no. I was just thinking, I wonder know. if he feels that way about Euron. <laughs> no, I, well, I still haven't. Does he? Sh doesn't he show up in uh, Feast for uh, Feast for Crows? He shows up much later, but yeah. Okay, because I'm I'm excited. I have I still haven't started it, um, but uh, I'm excited to read more on Euron and how big uh, of a difference it is from the show um because i've heard so so many things um but yes i love all of these characters like i keep changing like oh no this one's my top oh no this one's my top and i'm almost kind of want to stop doing that <laughs> even though it's almost it's a little bit hard to do it because obviously we we have our i don't know i feel like i connect with a, a lot of these characters so much um in a lot of ways and that's to me, the special thing about these books, I'm sure you can sort of relate. Oh, for sure. And George has a really great knack for making characters that shouldn't be likable, likable through their POVs. Um, and he has mm -hmm. a really good job at giving them all very individual and unique voices. So they do feel like different people. Um, on every reread, I switch around who my favorite characters are or my favorite POVs. On my most recent reread, I've really been enjoying a lot of Arya's chapters um, and Catelyn's chapters, but you know, my, my favorites constantly switch. I also do really like Sansa's chapters. I think something we kind of missed out a little bit on in the show is the importance of the fact that people are constantly telling her stuff um, that she probably shouldn't know and shouldn't be listening to thinking that, you know, this is just a dumb little girl. She's not paying attention. Mm -hmm. And then obviously she's just storing it all in her traumatized mind to catalog mm -hmm. for later, you know? So I think, you know, we missed out a little bit on that in the show in a lot of her King's Landing plots, but, um, that's, you know, part of the problem with adapting a show is that you lose a lot of the layers to these characters and kind of forsake them to be these, you know, more base level characters, which we still love, but you lose mm -hmm. the complexity and the richness that you get in these books. Totally. I, uh, so a little bit of, uh, a, a few people that have watched previous episodes know, but just to let you know, the way I found out about 
if I, okay, obviously you, you kind of figured. I suppose if I'm reading a song of ice and fire now, it's because I found out about the this whole world thanks to the show. Uh, that's how I first got introduced to this incredible world. And uh, yes, finishing uh, Storm of Swords had me thinking, like, man, like I can understand a little bit more, or not a little bit more, quite more uh the people that a lot of times get frustrated and disappointed with things that were changed and which i've always said i'm i'm okay with adaptations if the story you're giving me makes sense because obviously i can't judge people that have never read the books um and that you know they they sort of have to find this happy medium but at the same time, um, man, I feel like it's starting to get harder and harder to do that because all of us, the ones that are becoming adults, um, young adults and whatnot, uh, we are very much into the book sources, for example, in this case, the book source um, or main sources. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how things just uh, evolve with TV shows or like movies, just adaptations in general. But yeah, uh, oh, I for started sure. off. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, adaptations are always going to have to be different. Like if you wanted to do a direct book to, sh to show or movie adaptation, it would be a nightmare. It would be a lot of filler and some boring stuff. And it just wouldn't, there would be no flow to the story. It would be way too long. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think, yeah, there are ways to do it and kind of truncate, I use that word a lot, kind of make the story more condensed that work and fit. I think when Thrones was its best, and I love Game of Thrones, that's also how I got into the, the books. Um, I love Game of Thrones. I hate Game of Thrones. I have a lot of feelings about Game of Thrones. When it was good, it was really good. Those first, I would say, three to four seasons were very tightly written. Um, and... I had watched the first season of the show and then I picked up the first book and the first season follows pretty closely the first book. I would say save for like, um, you know, some of Daenerys' chapters and then kind of the characterization overall of Catelyn and Sansa, I think are yep. a little bit um, lacking. I think with the book, you see much more into their minds and you're, you oh, understand yeah. more. Um, but for the most part, I was like, oh, this is kind of a close one-to-one -one adaptation. So I just kind of watched the show. I didn't continue reading the books. And then once the show ended, I was really disappointed <laughs> with the ending. And yeah. then Fire and Blood came out. I read Fire and Blood. Um, and I was like, this is really good. Maybe I should return back to these books. Picked the books back up and was surprised by book two, how different things started being. And as the books went on, I was like, oh, this veers to a completely different course. Yep. So I'm very excited for you to continue because it just gets more and more different from here on out. Yeah, I uh, I'm excited. To me, I feel like I'm I'm the the way I am, um, and maybe because I got so much into the show, um, which by the way, I, yes, I was definitely disappointed with the ending, and I always say that. I feel, and some other day, some other day we can like deep dive more into things that worked and not didn't work towards the end. Um, but I always, my main problem will always come down to how things were incredibly rushed. I feel like you can definitely tell by season seven that they are just trying to give us like get to the finish line. Like let's just let's get this thing done. And that's it. Like, yeah, give me. They didn't want to pass the torch. They didn't want to. Pass I know, the I know, and that always kind of like frustrates me a little bit. It's like, like, why couldn't you just be like, hey, guys, like, let, let's bring in other writers. Let's bring in, you know, people that can maybe, like you said, carry on the 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 torch. And uh, I, I don't know what happened, really. Um, that will always be my biggest problem. Yes, I can make cases or, or like make a case for uh, like, I wish we could have gotten this or that uh, different in terms of like where plot lines or like characters ended up. 
but yeah, uh, it, it, at the end of the day, I also uh, like my feeling towards this show, uh, the way I felt for like the first five, six seasons and, and past that, because seven, seven and eight have incredible moments as well. That's something that a lot of people seem to forget as well. Like cinematically, I'm someone that I know that I don't take away or how do I say, um, like if you make me feel a certain way, type of way, you know, um, uh, cinematically and i'm over here like astounded by what they were just able to do um you know like the the long nights yes we can disagree on like why didn't john fight the night king why didn't do why didn't do this why didn't they do that why didn't they actually kill off these characters or like why did Arya had to be the one blah 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 all these things but cinematically i've i remember just being so like ast astounded or like mind blown by the things i was watching and and not believing the f like i couldn't believe the fact that this was tv i was like we should be watching this in imax really like um but uh again i have my fair share of problems and especially reading the books now i know that i'll definitely add more to the list uh because i've definitely have a few that i'm like why couldn't you just add this person like it would have been so easy like people would have not have a problem having like lady stoneheart for example um i think who cares think if they bring up who comes down to the fact that they didn't want to have too much magic in their fantasy show because it's like, oh, we yeah. can't have all the Starks be wargs because that'll take away the special magic of Bran being a warg or whatever rationale they had. We can't have Lady Stoneheart show up because that'll take away from John being resurrected or whatever. Like, it, there's clearly a lot of very magical moments that they chose for one reason or another to tone down. And I think ultimately it kind of hurts the story because I think people then mistake it for being like just um, medieval fiction versus it being a fantasy, which it is, it is fantasy. Yeah. At the end of the day. There's magic in this world. There are these yeah. kind of primordial forces of ice and fire that are out of balance. Um, right. And that's the true, the true um, conflict at the end of the day. It's not about the throne at all. That's like child's play. It's about, you know, the others and what's actually going to happen with that. That's the right. big thing that's, you know, coming for them all. So. Which is interesting because they are sort of, and I have my theories behind this, but they're sort of doing that with um, House of the Dragon and the whole prophecy of, of Ice and Fire and even Rhaenyra saying it in the last trailer, I believe it was, where she says something about like the, the one that sits the Iron Throne. It's not really a queen or king. It's a protector of the, it's the protector of the realm. So, yes maybe they're i have a very big kind i still i am not able to kind of like put it together but i've been thinking about this for a while and i'm i'm a like tell you here because i i might need help putting it together and if it's crazy just tell me i'm crazy <laughs> but um i've been thinking like what if they're doing this whole thing about the prophecy of ice and fire and including the whole prophecy um because of how of what brand became and a lot of times we forget and it just hit me or the other day it hit me <laughs> when i thought about it i was like this guy is probably just now watching this history like this part of history going down so who knows if they at some point would tie this to brand later on and what we got in season eight and all of that and in some sort of way they would try to i don't think rewrite and i don't want to get into the whole rewrite because whatever we got and what we got let's just yeah let's deal with it um but at the same time i feel like they're they have to do something with brand and house of the dragon if they're including this whole prophecy of ice and fire and who knows if who knows where this will lead really obviously but 
Um, maybe it's just me trying to make an excuse as to why they're including the whole prophecy of ice and fire into the show, uh, which I know so, a lot of people. So do you do not think like. it would open the door for them to do some type of then spinoff regarding Bran? Is that kind of what you're hinting at? Well, you see, if they do a, a spinoff towards like for Bran, here's the thing. Just like the snow show that got canceled or shelved for now, who knows? Maybe we'll get it later on. I feel like those are actually... I've got a feeling that it might actually be sort of a, a continuation to season eight of Game of Thrones. And I've seen people put out incredible stories. Actually, there's one guy uh talking thrones i think it is on youtube and he created a whole season nine um i think he wrote it and whatnot um he's not he said he's not a professional writer and whatnot so there's like a few things you know that are kind of wonky i suppose but uh he brought up like the fact that kenvara is still around um that other red priest uh priestess and the fact that Drogon took Danny uh, to shoot, I forgot the name. To Essos? Uh, in Essos, yeah, but there's there's a specific name. Shoot. Oh, to uh, Vol Volantis. Mm -hmm. And he like pretty much bases everything off of the fact that first of all, they didn't actually get rid of all of the the like the Night King was pretty much like a puppet. And there are actually, like, the real threat uh, when it comes to, like, the others are more in the South. And it has to do with the Isle of Faces, the Green Men. It's actually really interesting. So, I don't know. Maybe. I could, definitely, I could definitely see that. I've also seen people talk about how, you know, basically having Bran as this, like, omnipotent ruler forever isn't actually a great solution it's kind of like big yeah. brother where he watches and now sees everything it's like police state yeah. so you could definitely go into you know blood raven and the children of the forest and were they actually are they actually good and is this mm -hmm. really just their getting their control over the world again the children of the forest and you know because in the books there is you know some kind of dialogue that hints at and suggests, I don't want to get too deep into it because I'm ready, I want you to read it, um, but it kind of suggests that maybe, yeah, the children of the forest have their own agenda and aren't all good and that the conflict between the others is more than it seems. So I think if they wanted to, they could definitely open the door and do some soft retconning. Um, I've seen people get really mad at this though and they're like, oh, it wouldn't be canon, it would be fan fiction because that's not how George is going to end his story. But I'm like, we don't know how George is going to end his story. And... I'm going to be real. The show and the books are separate canons at this point. I personally was not happy with the ending of the show. So if they wanted mm -hmm. to do a soft retcon, I would be open to seeing what those possibilities were. Um, I know George has said to, with the Aegon's prophecy thing, because people were all saying, oh, that's fan fiction, blah, blah, blah. Like George did say, I think in an interview and or on his Nada blog a long time ago, something along the lines of, you know, oh, what if... You know, I'm not saying this happened, but what if, you know, Aegon the Conqueror had a dragon dream about the the thing in the north that, you know, this danger in the north, and then he kind of made up this prophecy, and that's why he felt the need to conquer and unite the Seven Kingdoms. And so it's like, yeah. I think a lot of these things are based in George's ideas, and I think that's fine. And again, we're doing an adaptation. If this adaptation and this soft reboot would get us a better and more satisfying ending, I'm all for it. I, I am too. Uh, just to throw in a little bit more info in terms of the story that he gave, he actually made Bran the villain, like slowly becomes the villain, and they all have to get together to pretty much, you know, get him out. Uh, so that would automatically take out the whole, like you said, have this omnipotent force or being... Uh, it's controlling you know, and ruling over and all exactly yeah, that's like so um, <laughs> i know it, it it makes things so boring really uh especially in george's uh it, whether you're inspired by george's work and you're doing a, a tv show a movie or whatever 
um, or it's well, actually it just, gorgeous. It just yeah. feels like having, yeah, a character who knows and sees all and all of time and controls everything and control of the whole world. That doesn't seem like a good and happy ending for this world. That doesn't seem no. like a balance to the world. That seems kind of just like we've traded one horror for another. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so, man, this, like I told you guys, <laughs> I love the... I freaking love this. This is this is why I brought you, man. I, I like I really wanted to talk to you because even even when we get sidetracked, it's always gonna be good. <laughs> um, so now that we're talking about prophecies, we kind of mentioned uh, House of the Dragon and whatnot. Uh, before we get into House of the Dragon season. One, I meant to ask you kind of overall thoughts before we get into season two talk. Um, but I wanted to kind of, and I hope I can do it right now because this thing for some reason is sort of acting up whenever I, I share my screen. That's I don't fine. know why, but, oh shoot, I think it did it again. I went black on my side. Okay. Anyways, I think I'll just bring it up uh, as in read it and not really show it on screen because I don't want to mess things up. Uh, but we got, let's see, I have it over here. The new, uh, or like news when it comes to Dunkin' Egg, the spinoff show that's coming out next year. And... First of all, he is talking about, as in George, in his not a blog, ever famous not a blog, a blog that we are always looking at just in case he is like, Winds of Winter is coming out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, he was talking about how things are moving along really, really well with uh, A Night of the Seven Kingdoms, which, by the way, starts production uh, in June as well. Uh, and he announced a few characters that will be announced uh, soon, I suppose, uh, or as in castings, new castings. Mm -hmm. And I don't know a lot of these. Actually, I don't know any of these characters right now, obviously, because I have not read uh, A Night of the Seven Kingdoms. I've been dying to read them. Uh, but just whenever I'm done with the main series, I'll, I'll get to it, or at least the five books that are out. Um, now I have heard Steely Pete because Mark House of Nettles, he's all he was advocating a lot for him to be uh, Steely Pete, <laughs> but it seems like he didn't get it. I'm sorry, Mark. <laughs> yeah, um, we we definitely need him to be in there though, as like as an extra or as a side character. I know, I know, he's so awesome. Uh, but yes, he was talking about uh, characters like Tencel, Steely Pete, uh, Baylor Breakspear. Uh, the Laughing Storm, uh, a couple of Fossilways, Arion Bright Flame. He says boo hiss in parentheses. What's that about? Do you like oh, oh Arion Bright Flame is just an insane person. <laughs> just really? an insane character. Um yeah. Uh you'll I mean, I'm very excited for you. So, you know get done with your read of the main series and then um the Dunkin' Egg novellas are a, an easy breeze they're so easy to read they're lighthearted. they're fun the tone is so different um the dialogue is much lighter it's really easy to read the stories are very short characters are very fun um yeah Erin Bright Flame um if I am remembering correctly is a um I guess Targaryen Prince Targaryen character who's just insane um, and so I'm, I'm excited for you to learn more about him. I'm excited. I think this will be season two, uh, for us to meet Rohan Weber. Um, that's a character I really like. Um, and, but yeah, for season one, I mean, there are, it is like a stacked group of really interesting characters. And it's funny cause like a lot of the characters that you know, and I don't know if you could say love, but a lot of the characters that you know from A Song of Ice Fire that are like older and in the background, like Blood Raven. Uh, like we we're mentioning Shira Sea Star, they're kind of in the background, and you're like, hey, hey, wait a minute, what am I hearing that Blood Raven is doing, you know, in, in these parts of the yeah. map? We're just kind of gonna glaze over that, or like, hey, Blood Raven's popping up over here and doing stuff. It's really fun, it's, it's a great time. I can't wait really to get into it. You know, Mark told me 
this is his take because I asked him, and you can tell me, uh, what do you think I should do? And it's he said not to read them and read them after the show is done, um, to go in like completely blind into the show. Um, I sort of, I don't know, it's tempting, but at the same time, I I told him I can't promise anything because. Right now, man, I'm on like the Song of Ice and Fire train and I want to read as much as I can. So far, before I started a Song of Ice and Fire, the only thing I had read was Fire and Blood uh, before season one came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Uh, I, I feel know. like Fire I, and Blood is the hardest one to read, too. Yeah. Oh, I definitely needed a lot of help uh, with... Yeah. Uh, it's funny. Um, everyone I ask, everyone's book. like, "Yeah, Fire and Blood sucks to read." Yes, <laughs> it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's hard uh, because it's a lot of times it's it's very dry, or most of the time it's very dry because um, you're and just getting you know yeah. event after event and a quote here and there, or like someone just you know random characters sometimes come up and 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 say things of. But did they really say what they, you know, what Archmaester Gildane is saying they said? <laughs> um, so, yes, I definitely had, it helped me a lot to do it with the audiobook as well. And I am doing that with uh, the A Song of Ice and Fire as well uh, series because it just, uh, it, it just helps me read so much better. Um, obviously, there's times where, like, I can't, like, be like physically reading you know yeah, the book sure. um so i put the the audiobook and like have my little notepad with you know taking notes and whatnot uh but a lot of times i just do both i'll be reading the book while i'm listening to the audiobook because first of all i don't know if you've done the audiobooks but man roy the trees He's insane. Well, sadly was because I found out he passed away and Absolute I'm so legend at the name pronunciations. We stand <laughs> oh. <laughs> Brian. Uh, good old good old Brian. <laughs> yeah, good old Brian. Pitire. Pitire. Uh, sometimes we get Joffrey being called Jeffrey. It's it's a fun wild ride. I love it. It's crazy, man. I you know what? I am when it comes to art and all of that. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm like 95% against like the whole AI stuff. Obviously, I'd rather have, you know, real people doing, you know, the, the work. And if you're going to use AI, just use it for you to like and as a, as a tool to help you get through uh, some minor things or whatever. Whatever. What I'm trying to say is if I'm ever going to be a huge advocate for AI, at this point is to have Roy Detrice's voice made up with AI or whatever and do the audiobooks for uh, the last two books with his voice because I, obviously if they get someone else, I'll, I'll be good, which obviously they're going to get someone else. <laughs> but um, I think yes. I think the best option is um, Harry Lloyd, the actor that plays Viserys in Game of Thrones. He narrates the audiobooks for Duncan Egg. Um, and so, and he has a great narrator voice. And so I think. Really? Yeah. I think getting him to narrate the last two books, um, you know, and we can all just recognize that, like, you know, Roy, you know, was a legend, sadly passed mm -hmm. away. But I think getting anyone else to, like, you know, getting a different actor to pretend to be him or something, I think. You know, like you're saying, doing maybe an AI voice, maybe with his like family's permission or something. If they're oh, know, totally, that's oh, an for option. sure. Um, but for I sure. wouldn't <laughs> mind Harry Lloyd doing it because, like I said, once you listen to the Duncan Egg books, his voice is really, really easy to listen to. He's a great narrator. Actually, now you've, I think you've sold me on reading uh, the Duncan Egg novellas, really. Well, because well, here's the thing: how long does it take you to read like the A Song of Ice and Fire books? How like a book? How quickly are you getting through them? Okay, um, I feel I started, I, I want to say it's been around like a little bit over a month, maybe. 
Because I was going to say, if you take your time with them and you're really slow with them and you think you'll still be working on them by the time the Dunkin' Egg show comes out, like, don't rush it. Then definitely read the Dunkin' Egg books, you know, after the show comes out. But mm -hmm. if you're going to if you're going to blow through a song of ice and fire and you're going to be bored and you're sitting yeah. there, I mean, yeah. I would read them. But, yeah. you know, I think that is really interesting, though, to be like, go in with fresh eyes where you know nothing because then you won't be spoiled at all. I think that's fun. But, you know, it's up to you. I don't mind spoilers and I want to know everything all the time. So I would not be able to resist. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's me for sure. Um, and you really... Read the world of ice if I read every other George book before you read. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's interesting because even though I had never read A Song of Ice and Fire, I consume so much. I've been consuming so much content uh, in the A Song of Ice and Fire world um that yes there's things that i don't know but for the most part i know quite a bit and i know characters and i know certain things that certain characters that i still haven't really heard of or or like read um so yes technically it's going to be hard to kind of uh like be be spoily yeah to be like very spoily uh for yeah. me because i again i've i've followed like yeah. you and, and creators, so many yeah, other people even before tiktok really i was so like deep in the trench of uh like when game of thrones was you know big time oh i'm sorry if you heard my dog <laughs> um but uh yes i even before with game of thrones i was so like into theories and whatnot just for the show um that yeah uh no for um, sure and like that's how i was too i you know i watched the show and then i kind of started watching um you know these youtube videos by all these different creators and i would fall to sleep i would fall to sleep to them at night just like playing in the background some of these videos are hours long yeah. um and it's so funny i remember my like college roommates they were like kind of getting into game of thrones and i was like oh you gotta watch these videos <laughs> and i said like, this video's three hours long i'm not gonna listen to that and i was like oh, okay that's just me i guess i'm just a little too into, into this uh, um, yeah but yeah so i got into it and into a lot of the lore because of these youtubers and so i feel like that's kind of the path you're on now where it's like i knew some of these character names but i hadn't seen them because either i hadn't gotten to that point in the show or they just didn't show up in the show at all and so i was like okay mm -hmm. i gotta pick up the books yep so. yep uh a big uh, like a pretty good example would be lady stoneheart um the the that scene like with the epilogue when the epilogue starts going because spoiler alert for anyone but you you get the first time you like interact or whatever in the book with lady stoneheart is in the epilogue of a storm of swords but when you start reading it you're like who the hell is Merit? Like, I, why do I care about Merit? But yeah. that's when you notice that George, it seems like for the most part, because he's also said, uh, I, I believe, I sort of remember uh, him saying something about not taking every prophecy to like to heart and like mm -hmm. taking it too seriously. Like sometimes prophecies that are that are mentioned in the book that like random people come around and is like say something weird and you're just like hmm i wonder what that meant a lot of times it doesn't really mean anything it's just like it just adds like mystery to the story and whatnot Sometimes the weirdo saying something <laughs> uh, yeah I, i'm like i'm literally writing everything up like i remember there was this uh this old lady i think it's in a storm of swords uh g comes up to aria and uh she tells Arya some sort of like a prophecy i was like okay i need to write this down i, I need to look it up later i, I can tell you all like the make ghost a little of video my heart for it. Uh, it, it might be i think it might be yeah, that the, the little old woman that's like weird yes, be creepy. yeah before the red wedding a few chapters before the red wedding i think it is yeah. um and uh yeah. but anyways yeah the the lady stoneheart stuff just reading it and not knowing where things are going and then when we actually get it it was just like man this 
it's really it's fun when you crazy. get those moments that you're like, this didn't happen in the show at all. And then again, yeah, you're kind of going in blind and then you can be really yeah. surprised in wonderful ways. And then you're like, how did the show not include this? Oh yeah, totally. That too. Um, but yeah, it, it again, uh, I've read a lot of spoilers, but a lot of them, I don't really know the, the, the story behind it and how we actually get to the point of the spoiler. Uh, so I've been looking forward to that a whole lot because I knew Lady Stoneheart was in the books like for a very good while, but it was awesome to see her for the first time or read about her. Uh, but for yeah. Sure. Uh, Did you want to talk a little House of the Dragon maybe and kind of... That's, that's what I was going to go uh, right now. Uh, so the first question that I was going to ask you with House of the Dragon, what are your sort of like general thoughts, overall thoughts of House of the Dragon season one? And again, you don't have to go like super deep into it. You can just literally be like, I like it and whatnot, but however I'm you want to do it. <laughs> I'm going to say something crazy that you can use as like a clickbait sound by. I didn't like House of the Dragon season one. I, Ooh. and I'm being controversial. I thought, you know, I mean, I watched it. I thought it was, I thought there were good elements to it, but I thought overall the season was kind of messy. I thought that it's a really hard story to adapt. You know, they're doing all this stuff with time jumps. They're relying really heavily on the Thrones fans by constantly being like, hey, remember this thing from Thrones? Remember Daenerys Targaryen? Remember the Red Wedding? We're going to have crazy Thrones moments. And for me, it, it all kind of came together as like kind of a, you know, I would say like, you know, B... B minus season for me, C plus, but, 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 but with that being said, I, know, go, go. I love the actors. I think the actors are amazing. I think the sets that season were really good. Um, and I have never been excited, like so excited for a season two. And it's crazy because I've never had a show where I was kind of meh on the first season that I've been incredibly mm. excited for the second season because it feels like first season was their growing pains. They were figuring it out. Obviously, everyone had these kind of wounds from season eight of Thrones. They're kind of testing out the water of, will people even like this? Let's try to shove in as much stuff as we can if we get, you know, only yep. one season. Whereas with season two, it's like they're in their element. Um, you know, there's clearly not as many COVID holdbacks now. The You know, they got these uh, enhanced wigs. They got, you know, the costume budget. They got the set budget. And so I think this season two has the potential to be incredible. And I'm so, so excited for it. I can't stress that and say that enough. So yeah, that is like big me ranting over. Um, what did you think of the first season of House of the Dragon? Actually, I think those that was greatly said. Um, I thought that, man, I don't know, maybe, I, maybe I, a lot of times I'm a little bit basic. <laughs> I don't know. I get so much in my feelings. I I enjoyed quite mm -hmm. a bit season one of House of the Dragon. Like, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, now, I will say, yes, I do understand that there were uh, moments in the story that it was a little bit messy. And like like you said, that's the whole time jump thing... Um, which is such a weird feeling because the actors were incredible. Millie mm -hmm. Alcock and Emma Darcy, they're both like awesome, as well as El Olivia Cook. And uh, shoot, I forgot her name or their name. Oh, uh, um, Millie Alcock, Olivia Cook, Emma Darcy, and um, Young Allison. <laughs> shoot, I hate it. Um, that's ah, shoot. Anyways, um, yes, I thought I thought season season one had a lot of uh, powerful moments that actually I sort of uh, appreciated, even though some of these moments weren't. Or actually, one specific moment I wasn't a huge fan of the character in the book, which is Viserys, and in the show. I am not a big fan of Viserys either. Like, I think that he did Emma and so damn wrong. Uh, but that scene where he comes in the, the throne room to defend uh, Rhaenyra and all of that, I still, guess go I still get goosebumps as to how powerful that moment was. Although 
uh, it kind of sucks because then it kind of goes nowhere with Allison thinking that he's he's choosing Aegon to be the 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 king now. But whatever. Uh, general, I I like this show, and I'm a sucker for dragons too. Um, and I know some people uh, deep into the whole fantasy genre are going to be like, oh, no, they're actually wyverns and blah, blah, blah. And yes, I know. I know. Yeah. Even in the books, they mention it. I know. But they also say dragon. So whatever. I'm going to go with what George says. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think there were incredible moments in season one. Um, and I think the I think that episode um, with Rhaenyra defending um, Luke's claim, like that whole episode, I think is one of the strongest episodes in the whole season, um, in my opinion. And uh, yeah, I think for me, the messiness, yeah, comes in in the writing of like how we are scripting these episodes, how we are, um, cause especially in the first couple episodes, a lot of the writing is very, to me, it felt on the nose of like really hammering home, being like, Rhaenyra, you can't do this because you're a woman. And I'm like, okay, we get it. <laughs> like we get, yeah. it sucks for yeah. women in this world. They can't do a lot of things. It just felt yeah. a little too, but by, I would say episode three, the writing started to get tighter and more um, uh, consistent and it felt like they were kind of getting it. Um, I think the handling of the Valarian characters will always bother me. I think kind of cutting down Lena and Lenor, I think, but that again is kind of what you get with this time jumping. I wish we would have been able to uh, see Harwin and Rhaenyra a little bit more. I know George I even know. talked about fleshing out their story and how nice that would have been. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so weird to have a season of a show where it's like, I liked so many things about it. Um, and then there was a lot of things that I didn't like, or I felt like fell flat or weren't quite there. Like I said, it felt like it had growing pains, um, but a lot of good bones, if that makes sense. And so no, totally. like said, season two, it feels like they got it figured out. And I'm excited because a lot of these new interviews uh, that they've been coming out with for House of the Dragons seem like they're kind of hinting towards some of those things. Yep. Yep. Uh, I think that, uh, I haven't rewatched season one, uh, and I actually plan on rewatching it uh, here soon uh, before the season two comes out. So if you're interested, in, I, I'm I'm still kind of working how to do it, but I would love to do even sort of like a watch party kind of thing. Uh, so if you're ever interested in that, uh, let me know because yeah, it would be awesome. If not, then I'll just you know probably just watch it myself and maybe get together with whoever wants to join me but maybe that'll give me a more critical eye into like be a little bit more nitpicky even though i don't like really nit how do you say nitpicking right i'm sorry Nit people my yeah. spanish i sometimes get no you're fine yeah nitpicking but it's interesting because <laughs> um you know like for me my eye is really on costumes and i really like looking at the intentionality and the theming of costumes and like that was one of the things in season one i felt like was underutilized I mm -hmm. thought um, there were instances where, for example, there were times where Rhaenyra and Alicent wore dresses made of the same fabric, but the costumer didn't connect them at all in the story. Whereas like, I was like, oh, this could be a really interesting visual moment of connecting these two characters, but they seemingly wore them at like different points of the timeline. They had nothing to do with each other. And um, one of the things I really liked about Thrones originally was that all the costumes regionally had like their own regional style that denoted different cultures and really added yes. to the world building. Whereas like that was seemingly a bit missing from House of the Dragon season one, but uh, season two has a new costume designer and it seems like they're taking a lot of these things in mind and being more intentional with it. Mm -hmm. With that, I know people who like their specialty is um, like film and special effects. I know, you know, for example, my boyfriend, he uh, works in kind of those fields. And so his eye was really looking at like the lighting of the show, the color correction, um, you know, how they're, you know, utilizing the darkness and the shadows and all of that. And so, you know, people have these different specialties that they can then pick out and, you know, have examples of ways they think it succeeds or um, could be improved upon, et cetera. And so yeah. it's really lovely to see all these other creators who have their specific niches, you know? Yeah. I think what you just mentioned about the whole costume design and how, just just the costumes can tell you a story and how you've been able to depict that and uh, just expand on this world. I just love it. Um, I think you've even talked about uh, 
uh, shoot, like in Bravos, mm -hmm. there's like certain hairstyles for depending on like your class, was mm -hmm. it? Um, yeah, so it would for, be um, your husband's profession and if you're married or not, like for women, these different hairstyles and hair clips that denote that. So all of these things are all really intentional and have these huge teams that put so much love into them. And so I right. love when it is successful in getting across the story. Right. So it'll be really I'm, I'm hoping that we get to see more of that in season two. And if you said that there we got a new which. Now that I think about it, it, it makes a lot of sense because a lot of these characters look different. Like starting off with Jace, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he, I think he looks way better than what we got in season one, as well okay. as the 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 dragon twins, uh, Bela mm -hmm. and Reyna. Um, and I'm sure you can just add even more to that. But... Uh, Yes, I think you you said something very interesting. Uh, House of the Dragon season one definitely gives us the bones, the 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 base for it to be actually great uh, down the road. Uh, and I feel like, do you feel like maybe as seasons go by, you might actually looking back like more season one the way they went about it. Um, a story well, I, like in general yeah i i think i will always have my grievances with season one but the way i'm kind of looking at it now is season one is basically all just scene setting it's preliminary stuff to get to the meat of the story which is going to be yeah. the action in season two and season three and so it's like we needed to get all of this background setting out of the way all of this history of these characters so that we can then drop ourselves into season two into what is happening in this conflict and so looking at it from that perspective of like this is kind of a, you know, like I said, chopped up, shortened history. We don't really see all the ins and outs. We don't see all the stuff, but it gives you enough to kind of go off of for these next seasons to understand right. and fully grasp the story. And I think looking at it that way, I'm fine with it. I'm comfortable with it. And I like it more. Um, yeah. So I think for me, that's kind of just how I'm looking at it. It's like season one is almost just the history of all these characters. I think that's that's a really good way to look at uh look at season one um something that uh and we can sort of start going into uh season two maybe um i hate that i can't for some reason this thing is not letting me it's like messing up my computer i wanted to bring up a certain uh like shots that i had and whatnot i don't know what's happening but um we can maybe use the last because i had opened the the all of the trailers and maybe we could like pick a few things out of all of them. So we can mainly go off of the latest trailer, but if there's something you remember from the previous trailers, um, we can definitely talk about. Uh, but season two, uh, we've already said we're pretty excited for season two. And I, we both think it's actually gonna be like pretty, pretty damn good. <laughs> uh, and in my case, well, actually, no, in your case, what are you most looking forward to besides the costume designs improving from what we got in season one um, and the story starting to align itself better? Um, what are you most looking forward to uh, for season two besides that? I think for me... Yeah, the story's gonna be a little bit more linear from here on out. We're probably going to have little to no more time jumps, which I'm very thankful for because um, I want to be able to breathe with these characters. I think that was my biggest problem with the time jumps is that we didn't get enough time to care about these characters and to really live with them. And so having a whole season now with these characters, this is our final kind of cast for these characters, for our Rhaenyra, for our Alicents, for our Daemons, for our Jaces. So I'm very excited for that to actually exist with these characters. Because you think about it with Thrones, some people complained that um, Thrones was too slow. I disagree. I thought the pacing of Thrones was great. I thought it made me really fall in love with those characters. And so I'm hoping, you know, I've heard that this season two is kind of breakneck pace though, but either way, I think um, that form of storytelling and having that more linear arc where we get to spend more time with these faces, I think will be really, really fabulous. Um, as far as plot points, um, the drama is just going to be ramped up this season. We're finally getting into, like I said, the meat of the conflict. So mm -hmm. I'm excited for that. I also, yeah. I recently talked about this. 
I'm so excited to see more of the Dragon Twins. We barely saw them in season one. A lot of their scenes were cut out, again, for the reasons I mentioned before. But yeah. they're kind of front and center in a lot of these promos. So we should hopefully be seeing them have more action. And there's a lot of kind of rumors going around that Reyna has kind of a bulked up story this season, which I'm fine with. Again, it's an adaptation. Me, and I'm excited too. to see where it goes. I, I am too. Um, I know it's received... Uh, Quite a bit of backlash uh, because obviously, for those of you that don't know, uh, Reyna, it seems, Reyna Targaryen seems to be taking on the plot line of a very beloved, mysterious, pretty badass character in Fire and Blood called Nettles. Uh, and it seems like Reyna is going to be taking on that. And a lot of people aren't too happy. I feel like actually, I want to say it's like a 50-50 and who knows if even like maybe like a 70-30, 70 being okay with the like, you know, with the change and giving the change an opportunity uh, to see what they give us with uh, a more uh, uh, prominent uh, presence for Reyna because in the books we sort of get Reyna but we don't really get Reyna until pretty much the dance is over um so i am also excited for reyna's uh, uh up in screen time as well as bela man I, every time i see bela in the trailers i just I, i'm always yelling or or like screaming uh you know out of excitement because i just freaking love bela um, and I just love the the kids in general. Like Jace is another character that I absolutely loved in Fire and Blood. Um, and I'm so excited to see more in season two. So when Ryan came out and said that they were going to uh, give the, the kids more of a center stage, I was super excited for that. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy. And I, I'm down for the whole Reyna uh, plot change which a lot of people also don't seem to i, I don't know i've I, I made a video about this as well um i feel like you can still we can still get a lot of uh reyna's plot line towards the end of uh of fire and blood i feel like we can get some of that with mourning I, I don't want to get into the whole fire and blood thing, but uh, yes, I feel like we can still get some of that plot line, uh, but I'm good with the. Yeah. With the I mean, I, I am, you know, I'm of two minds. I'm mad about it because I love nettles. I love her. I and it's very thematically important to this uh, story element that George is putting in of like, you know, the power of the small folk of like, what if these kind of no name, not Targaryen traded individuals got a hold of dragons. I think it's, you know, and showing this old Valyrian way of bonding with dragons. I think that's all very important that she's, um, yeah, like I said, a, a, a nobody being able to mm -hmm. claim the dragon versus these, you know, it kind of changes the the theming and the um, the story of her claiming sheep stealer to have Reyna, a royal person with Targaryen and Valyrian blood claim this dragon. It kind of changes um, that a bit, but at the same time, Again, it's an adaptation and the themes of the show and the story they're telling is different from the themes in the book. Um, yep. And if they felt that they could not do Nettles justice and adapt her fully, I would rather them not do it. I'd rather them, you know, do what they're doing. Um, and also we don't even really know though. We don't, we'll have to just wait and see. So. Truly, uh, that's the other thing. There's been also like set pictures, which I don't really like getting into those a whole lot, even though I know what's going to happen, but uh Yes, there's even been set pictures that look like nettles. A nettle um, character, yeah. Yes, uh, you probably saw the one I saw, which has, uh, we won't really say who they are, but Ulf the White and uh, uh, Hugh Hammer, uh, which we don't stand Hugh Hammer and Ulf the White. <laughs> boo hiss, as George would say, boo hiss. Exactly, yeah. boo hiss. Um but I don't know. I'm, I'm excited for the Dragon Twins as well. Um, in my case, I am also really, really excited for Krieg and Stark and the whole involvement of the North. Whatever it is we get from the North, 
I'm down. Um, I just can't wait. I can't wait to see the things that Jason Cregan talk about, if they are actually going to be things that will add to the whole mystery of what happened in Winterfell um, with whatever theory is out there, really, because I can go from the Sarah Snows of the world and I can go to like nothing happened and uh, as in like, well, I don't want to spoil it. But, uh, it's more my, like a theory. My favorite but. cracked out theory is that um, Sarah Snow is Cregan's drag name. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's his drag that name. would be really <laughs> interesting I was like, that's a good one really i love awesome. those i love those goofy you know just kind of silly uh, uh joking theories um yeah cregan's the goat though i'm so excited to see him um yeah. i think incredible fun character uh the winter wolves i remember when i oh, you know man. when i first read fire and blood and like their their um passages or their uh introduction i was like Oh, shit's getting real. I don't know if I can say it on yes. your podcast. Sorry. Oh, no. Well, dude, go ahead. <laughs> it's, yeah, You're like good. stuff is getting real. I mean, not that stuff already wasn't getting real with some of these battles, but like they mean business. And I'm very excited to see them show up. Totally. I, I keep going around uh, in my mind as to whether or not Krieg and Stark is my favorite Stark of them all. <laughs> I just love Krieg and Stark. Um, the his presence his the way he like is this young lord that f feels like has people behind him uh which starks for the most part you know are that way even though i've heard of the other ones that there's some weird and kind of scary starks throughout history <laughs> um which we can talk about that some other day. But uh, yes, I just love Krieg and Stark. Uh, and I can't wait to see him in House of the Dragon season two. Uh, every trailer just has me more and more excited. And uh, yeah, I, I can't wait, really. I, th I think it's going to be really, me, really good. I hope they don't make him too too much like a Ned because you know we all have to remember that Ned obviously was fostered uh, by Robert Aaron and so he's not like a mm. typical example of a Stark whereas like yep. Cregan and some of the other Starks you know like I mentioned they're the winter wolves they're a little more ruthless a little more mm -hmm. cold they got in their veins they mean business and I mean Ned did stand on business but um, I think you know Cregan is obviously going to be honorable but maybe a little less chivalrous maybe a little less hesitant in things you know I think about Ned's choice to tell Cersei and try to warn her. And I'm like, I think, I don't think Cregan would do that. I think Cregan would just be, you know, we're, yep. we're mean yep. in business. And so I'm excited <laughs> to see, I hope we get that more kind of ruthless and like, you know, serious side of the Starks. Right. It, it definitely would be a, an awesome version or new version of what uh, people expect from Starks especially uh people that have only watched uh the show and oh, have yeah. never read the books um it's gonna be really really good um because like you said I, remember I read fire and blood and you know he's he's cleaning up some of the mess is all i'm gonna say and you're like dang this guy is you know he's serious and he is honorable and he's sticking to his oaths so he is he totally is to the point where you're sort of like i don't know if it happened to you while reading the book but you're like dude just take a moment deep breaths like you're you're wanting to go after people that also helped um, yeah yeah he's uh, like he's like <laughs> he's like we're getting rid of anyone that's not useful <laughs> like yes i know um but yes the hour of the wolf that is yep. all we're going to say <laughs> um something let's see things that have me really excited or that i'm very intrigued for season two as well is uh characters like helena targaryen which we stand helena targaryen uh sweet girl that uh yes uh, we just have to protect helena targaryen it don't matter if you're team black or whatever if you're into all of that um no, Helena Targaryen, we protect. Um, and I also am very excited to see what they do with Alice Rivers, which I'm sure you probably are really excited about too. Mm -hmm. And another 
girl that I'm hoping they have her in the show is our girl Black Alley. Mm-hmm. Alison like Blackwood. Sabatha Frey and some of these other characters. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know. Uh, those are just three that come to mind. Obviously, Jane Aaron as well. Oh, got it. No um, yeah, there's and there's a lot of, you know, again, mysteries that it'll be interesting to see how they handle, like the Sarah Snow situation. Um, yeah, the I feel like they've created a new mystery now with what's going on with Reyna's plot line. So we'll have to see what's going on with that. Um, obviously, yeah. the continuation of this A Song Rise and Fire prophecy that was largely kind of omitted from the books. So we got a lot to look forward to. And I want to say, I don't actually hate season one. I was just being controversial. But I mean, I, I do have my problems with it. But like <laughs> I said, there are things that I love about it. There are. There are some scenes that I think are wonderful. And it's just, yeah, it's I, I'm just so complicated on my feelings with it. But I've never, never before been so excited for a season two. I just can't wait. Listen. I think your points were more than valid and they come from a place of ultimately loving this world as much as I do. And a lot of other awesome, a song of ice and fire game of Thrones universe creators. Something that's very interesting is the fact that, uh, Heron hall, mm -hmm. the, the whole thing that's happening in Heron hall, it seems like they are going to, Uh, how do you say expand maybe on on that and have Damon have these dreams which or hallucinations which we don't know if it's actually Alice Rivers messing with him um, or if it's actually the place because for those of you that don't know Heron Hall is this probably the most cursed place in in Westeros. Uh, So it's going to be really interesting because Ryan Condal, I believe he mentioned something about, uh, I'm not going to quote him because I don't exactly remember what it was, uh, the exact words that he said, but it was pretty much making Heron Hall a horror uh, kind of situation. So I'm very interesting or very interested in that too. Uh, yeah, and I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, death and violence at Heron Hall, and I'm fingers crossed that we do get some cool magic because I think obviously we have the dragons and they're very magical, but I think we're missing some of those elements and obviously the, you know, the first show chose how magical they wanted it to be, but I wouldn't mind if this, you know, if House of the Dragon ramped up the magic a little bit because we do have more dragons in the world and it is a more magical time. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind if Alice Rivers is doing some spooky witch magic and is doing some cool stuff. I know. Um, Or if Heron Hall was for cursed. That. I'm down for that too. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've even, some people seem to think that that scene where, um, with like Damon over in Heron Hall and whatnot, mm -hmm. and there's a scene of Rhaenyra and uh, Flying Cyrax, And it kind of looks like she's going towards Heron Hall. Um, and some people think that she's actually going there to kind of save him or something. I'm she's like, going hmm. to pick up her man. He's like, babe, I'm sick. <laughs> yeah. <wrote> <laughs> yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting. I don't know. I think, uh, yeah, I think this second season is going to be really, really good. Uh, I can't think about anything else they've talked about. Uh, I think they Ryan Condal here recently talked on the Den of Geek about two big battles, uh, which there's please don't look these up. If you guys have have not read the books, please do not look this up unless you love spoilers. Um, but the Battle of Rook's Rest, mm -hmm. it's most definitely I feel like should be the the main uh battle mm -hmm. in this season. And but supposedly there's going to be another huge one. Uh, I was thinking they would do Burning Mill, mm. but some people think that we might actually get Battle of uh, the Gullet, mm. and I'm like, no, I don't. I, I'd I'd rather have the Gullet season three. Yeah, um, I think I'd rather Gullet not have it at all, actually. But <laughs> yeah, I think Gullet needs to be season three. But yeah, Rook's Rest. It's definitely happening this season. And they said that these battles are going to rival anything they did in season one, which makes sense. I feel like, um, in my opinion, the battles in season one weren't that crazy. 
Um, huh. I think about, you know, the, the crab feeder stuff and yeah, there's some cool stuff, but I think they could definitely ramp it up and I'm excited for that. Yeah, I think so too. I thought it was funny in that article, the author, um, incorrectly categorized, uh, Lena as Damon's first wife. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. He said that his children are with his first wife and everyone's like, no, they're not. <laughs> huh. Yeah. That's yeah. That's definitely no. <laughs> cracks, cracks um, up when you, because like when you're an eagle-eyed fan, you catch little things like that, and you're like, Wait. right, right. It, it's also like uh, on that news article, a lot of people were. Some people, I say a lot of people. <laughs> sometimes it's literally just one tweet like and like a few comments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but some people were talking about uh, that Ryan Condo said something about like Sunfire and uh, and Aegon having like the biggest bond in like Westeros history. About that. Yeah. Yes. So I went back to and like read that specific part. And I think I'm, I'm sort of confused as in what to actually make out of that. Uh, because he says something about along the lines of... Uh, uh, shoot, if I can bring it up my, again, my computer is is acting up, and I can't bring well, it up. Said, he said that oh, like Aegon and Sunfire had one of the strongest dragon bonds, if you believe you know Maester propaganda. And so May, uh -huh. wanted, that's what it was. He wanted that to translate well, and I'm like, okay, so you are believing Maester propaganda though? Is that the story you're trying to tell? Because in my mind, what I think personally is that yeah, saying that Aegon and Sunfire had the strongest dragon bond. That part is the Maester propaganda, but then looking at Aegon's actions of him then trying to and wanting to claim another dragon later on, that shows right. that to me that like their bond wasn't that strong if he could, because I'm like, if your bond was that strong with your dragon, you would never be able to have another dragon again. Like you would be like, no, that was my soul dragon, you know? So I'm like, it's looking at the Maester's words versus the character's historical actions, you know? Yes, uh, I get what you mean. Um... So what what he said is, if you believe Westerosi historical propaganda, mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of 50-50. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's giving, are you believing this or are yeah. you just throwing it out there for us to be like, do I believe that or not? When it comes to obviously uh, sneaky and, and, and fake ass um, Archmaester Gildane. Um, <laughs> Well, um, yeah, it's interesting because saying if you believe propaganda, they have the strongest dragon bond. So we wanted to depict that or whatever he said. And I'm like, so you're choosing to interpret it as the maester propaganda was correct. And you're showing that on yes. screen is that the thing. Or are you are you just saying, you know, maybe we're going to show that on screen. Who knows? Wink, wink. You know, I feel like I'm hoping it's the latter because right. like I said, I hope that they're kind of reading through the lines of some of this maester propaganda. But, you know, who knows? Um, now that we're talking about propaganda and we can get back to like the dragons, um, mm -hmm. because there's a few things I, I know that you are, uh, a big advocate, uh, when it comes to not being, it feels like you're 50, 50 with the dragons in house of the dragon, but speaking about propaganda, what's your take on the whole Alicent and, uh, Rainita? promos that have been going on i have my theory it's it's i mean it's not a tinfoil theory but <laughs> the promo that has like the dragon in the background and one of the heads is broken off so okay so a lot of people are making uh like a big deal which is understandable really because like the whole problem ultimately is reynita versus aegon but it's all been focused heavily more so on set pictures or not not set pictures promo, promo pictures. pictures uh to be allison versus rainita yeah. uh and i know a lot of people have not liked that i'm also like at first i was like it's kind of weird because at this point for season two things should be more surrounded around or like uh revolved around Aegon and rainita but I don't feel like that whole promo of Allison and Rainita is actually, it doesn't take away from Aegon versus Rainita. I'm sure we're, uh, we're going to get that. Uh, I feel like some people are getting worried that 
it won't actually be a war between Aegon and Rhaenyra. And I, I, I think it, it will be. Like, there's no way they won't mm -hmm. have that front and center. Um, and they even teased that in the trailers, actually. So I have a lot of thoughts on this. A lot of them. Yeah. Um, so firstly, we need to address that obviously the original story was the princess and the queen. So I've seen people say, you know, at the heart of it, it has always been Alicent versus Rhaenyra. And while I think that is true to a degree, I think we also do need to remember um, that the claims are Aegon's claim, a man's claim versus Rhaenyra's claim, a woman's claim, and that this story at its heart deals with a lot of themes of, you know, patriarchy, misogyny, um, and even the way that the maesters write this story and use Alicent and Rhaenyra as scapegoats for the war is, you know, heavily drenched in misogyny and patriarchy to blame it all on these two women when really in the background there were a lot of other people and a lot of other factors puppeting it around and, you know, George's built it all in this world that is heavily impacted by male primogeniture, you know, the idea that only a male can inherit the throne. Um, mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, patriarchy, what a woman can and can't do. And so um, I think obviously we have highlighted that this dispute is between two friends. That's what the adaptation of the show is going for. And so it makes sense that in the promos, we're seeing them against each other to ramp up that drama. But I think, um, with that, unfortunately, you know, with an adaptation, some of the subtleties are lost a bit. And if it goes over people's heads in the books, because I see people say in the books, oh, you know, um, the Dance of the Dragons was completely Alicent's fault, completely Rhaenyra's fault. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I think Otto was in there doing stuff. I think Aegon was doing stuff. I think Aemon and uh, I think Damon, I think they were all contributing. I think Corlys is somewhere in there too. And mm -hmm. then you got Laris and Mizaria, who are yeah. probably big big brother puppeting the whole thing and you got the maesters and their propaganda so i think yeah then you boil it down in a show and you got all these promos of alice and rhaenyra and so with these promos i think it um gives us this problem of kind of falling into that again that maester trap of putting the blame on just two women all the time and i think right. people see that and again i see people on twitter that only watch the show saying, oh, it's completely Alicent or completely Rhaenyra's fault. And again, losing that subtlety. And so I would like to see um, some promos that are Aegon and uh, Rhaenyra that are the two claimants, the two figureheads mm -hmm. of these sides. But I do think um, it makes sense with the story we have right now to see it as Rhaenyra and uh, Alicent because it's kind of what we've set up. So, yeah. you know, I'm like, I would love to see more Aegon and Rhaenyra. I hope we do see it. I think season two will give us more opportunities. And so hopefully by season three, we will be seeing a lot more of that. But I think, you know, it is what it is for now. I just hope people don't lose out on all those nuances and subtlety. And sorry, I know that was like a big, long rant. No, 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 no. no I, that was perfect. <laughs> no, no, no. That was perfect. I think that, uh, so what the, one of the biggest reasons I think they're like, like doubling down on Rainita or it were Rainita and Alicent promo has to do a lot with the fact that everyone just loves Olivia mm -hmm. Cook mm -hmm. and Emma Darcy and the whole uh ooh stunning what was it the uh what's your Negroni name choice Spagato, yeah yes when when that came out some people may not realize but that was actually like historical in pop culture, at least for that year. Um, like it was everywhere. And I feel like they're double downing on 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 that whole Olivia and Emma uh promo, which is fine. Um the only thing that I that kind of gives me hope, and I don't want to jump the gun also. Uh, I, I hope that's how you say it. Damn it! Sometimes I sometimes I say <laughs> these these sayings in English, and I say them so comfortably. Sometimes thinking that I'm saying it correct, and I'm always scared that I'm actually not saying it correct. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you're but, totally yes, fine. I, cool. Uh, but yeah, like I don't want to jump the gun either, and and be like base. Uh, uh, how, how, how do I say it? Like, just think that they won't give us Aegon mm -hmm. and versus Rainita because they're promoting Allison and Rainita in the promo pictures for season two. Because uh, ultimately, people that have not watched or read the books 
they don't know what's like about to happen. Um, so a lot of it is just based off of what we last got in season one, which is full on Allison plotting a lot of things. Or not plot, well, more plotting towards the end, because at the end, does, is she really plotting? No, she's Debatable. just being puppeted. Yeah, she's just being puppeted by her father, uh, sneaky ass uh, Otto Hightower. And then she realizes how uh, she's actually not in power after they do the whole plot uh, of like keeping Rainey's prisoner and, and like and uh crowning Aegon and blah 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 she was thinking oh i'm gonna be able to control Aegon and like do all these good things for the realm but then she realizes like you said earlier misogyny and, and patriarchy she doesn't have control um oh shoot uh but yes I, man I, I don't know it kind of gets into as well i think allison is one of is the more sympathetic lens into the greens um i yes. think people love olivia cook and so it makes sense that they're having her against Rhaenyra because you know having her against Aegon I'm gonna be real Aegon's not as likable as Alicent is uh -huh. you know we feel much more sympathetic for Alicent than we do for Aegon um because you think about Aegon you think about his character um and so it makes sense they're putting them against each other because they said you know oh there's heroes and villains on both sides and so I was trying to think of who are the heroes on the green side and I don't know if you could quite say Alicent and Helena are heroes but I think they're both very sympathetic um yeah. and I think they're likable to a degree and so it makes sense yeah, they would yeah. put the most likable green with Rhaenyra I think too though like I said I would love to see a Rhaenyra and Aegon promo in some way I'd love to see photos oh, yeah. of them together yeah. or something because I think even though Aegon is his own character in his own right I think he's also this thematic pillar you know he represents everything that Rhaenyra is up against he's a male claimant he has bastards of his own that he's terrible to he's mm -hmm. an altar he's just kind of this character that's everything of the patriarchy that yeah. she's up against. And so having that symbolism there in photos for these promos would be kind of fun. Um, but those are just my thoughts on it. I think, no, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, I hope we do get a a Rainita versus Aegon kind of promo picture. Oh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, because this goes into no. too, the photos, the photos of the yeah. young kids. Yeah. They're kind of showing now, you know, uh, it's Jace and Bela and Reyna, and then yeah. it was versus Allison's kids. And so it's kind of like, oh, it seems like this is, they're kind of categorizing it as the second generation beef is between these guys. And so I hope we still do get some Aegon and Aemond versus some of the older adults, you know, Damon, Rhaenyra, et cetera. But yes. I don't know. I don't know. Uh well, at least it should be a certain thing that we're getting like the whole uh, Aemon versus a uh, Aemon versus Damon, yeah. um, and we got it in the trailer when he's talking about, or Aemon is talking about, like welcoming uh, uh, Damon to a fight or whatever he's telling uh, Kristen Cole. Uh, but uh, bye. Sorry. No, no problem. What I was gonna say uh yeah just I, I don't know i think that we have to sort of take it easy right now mm -hmm. i think we are all super excited for season two to come out and get all the answers and i think ultimately we will get the uh most of the things that we want at least that's the vibe yeah, that's like the vibe that I've gotten from the trailers, which I love the trailers because they haven't really shown us, they haven't been, they haven't been super spoily, uh, which is something that sadly a lot of trailers do nowadays. Like they'll tell yeah. you like all the movie and they'll put it out there. And it's like, dude, keep that for the movie or like for whenever I go watch it at the movie theater or a, a TV show. Um so I do appreciate the the things that they've put in the the trailers to hype us up, and uh, still not be super spoily. Um, uh, what I was gonna say, oh, dragons! I was uh, I meant to tell you or ask you. Uh, I know that you're sort of 
kind of 50 50 at least it seems that way to me uh with dragons in house of the dragon or who knows maybe you're fully against like the dragons um uh so yes what are your sort of like opinion i know you don't like the colors that much <laughs> yeah i love i love dragons i love the dragons i think these people need to stop using these dragons as weapons and just let them be dragons um i yes. think I think I wish, yeah, the colors and the saturation was turned up a little bit more. Um, but again, we're just seeing these trailers. I think one of my bigger complaints about just the lighting in general of season one is a lot of the times when the dragons were around, it was very kind of smoky and hazy and foggy. And I think it's to save on budget. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm like, you're a huge HBO show and I'm sure HBO would just give you all the money you want. So go for it. Make those dragons... HD. I want to see all the scales. I want to see the iridescence on Sunfire because it's supposed to be the most beautiful dragon. I'm like, I need yep. close-ups. Um, I'm excited. I love the dragons. I hope we see so many more. My favorite dragon in the books is Grey Ghost. Um, Ooh, just yeah. Yeah. What about you? What's your favorite dragon? My favorite dragon, uh, it's so hard, but my favorite dragon is Cyrax. Mm-hmm. I just and the the show really kind of like made it super clear that Cyrax was going to be my favorite, not just because of Rainita. I love Rainita, um, but it's just like this bond. I just love the bond that uh, Cyrax has with Rainita, and also not that we don't see other awesome bonds because like you can make okay. an argument that Damon's uh, bond with Caraxes is actually the best bond in House of the Dragon. Mm -hmm. um, and that scene, for example, in, in episode three at the with the fight with the uh, crab feeder and whatnot, where the 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 arrow hits Damon and like Caraxes like reacts to it. Mm -hmm. That is such an awesome detail right there. But we also see that with Rainita whenever she's like giving birth mm -hmm. Um, and sadly, in that last episode, I believe it's the last episode, um, where she, you know, has a miscarriage and whatnot, and they show you that connection with uh, Cyrax. There's something about Cyrax that I just absolutely love. It's like I've said before, I feel like Cyrax is almost like a domesticated pet, like a cat, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it has that vibe to, to her. Um, but ultimately, I, I love all of the dragons Maylee's Maylee's looks probably you you could make an argument that Maylee's is one of the more beautiful dragons in in House of the Dragon huh? I think so and I think I'm hoping we are in for a treat for a little surprise and seeing Tesserion the blue queen because Ooh, that's I know and I'm like I need to see this beautiful blue dragon I need to see what's going on there and I yes. think they're definitely saving that they've mentioned briefly Daron and I think they're like teasing us I really hope he's in season 2 or 3 I hope Yeah yeah I think uh another thing about that I've okay so something that I've actually enjoyed a lot when it comes to the dragons in House of the Dragon and I saw it even more uh, I made a video about it recently. I saw it even more with Moon Dancer now. Uh, and again, for those of you that don't know, Moon Dancer, I'm sure it's not like uh, Rainy's uh, like direct uh, descendant, or it's not. It, okay, Moon Dancer didn't come out from one of Rainy's, uh, not Rainy's, uh eggs, eggs that yeah. I know of. Uh, but I thought it was a really interesting thing that if you look at Moon Dancer, it's sort of it sort of has, and I hate that I can't show the picture right now, but it sort of has this crown on top of it. Uh, it's more like a uh, uh, man. I, I don't know how to explain like it really. Spikes. More than yeah. it just yes, these spikes on top of its head that look almost like a crown, and it's interesting because it's Bela Targaryen's dragon who's Rhaenys's granddaughter. So when you look at Maylis, the Red Queen mm -hmm. has that crown of like horns all around its neck, its head. So I wonder if they did that on purpose just to kind of give this uh, like character to the dragons, which I sort of 
got uh, the impression that they did uh, yeah. a pretty, you know, something they did in, on purpose. That's an interesting choice. I wonder if Tessarion will have a similar crown because it's like they called Maylis the Red Queen, obviously because, you know, Rhaenys was the queen and never, never was, but also because she had kind of a crown. And so I wonder if Tessarion has a similar thing going on. I've been very curious oh. about that. Or I've always wondered, it's like, did they call her Tessarion the Blue Queen because the green side was like, well, we need a queen dragon too. We have we have <laughs> Tessarion the Blue Queen if you guys got Maylis. And so I'm curious to see like if it's really like, she has that queen crown or if that is was a little bit of you know again maester propaganda trying to really prop up the sides like i think there's room to do some really cool stuff here i really liked that um moon dancer too seemed kind of stripey i think that was a good way if you're gonna have the dragons be kind of toned down maybe give them like kind of textural and like yes yes differences, so i absolutely love those uh striped uh membranes which mm -hmm. I don't remember that being in the book. So it was definitely a good add-on that I was not expecting. Uh man, I can't wait to again. I'm I'm a sucker for for all of the dragons. I love all of them. Yeah. Um and uh I actually thought Vermithor they they did a better job at showing Vermithor at the end of the last trailer compared to what we got. I, I liked, I sort of liked the way they did it in, in, in season one where Damon goes to get him in the, in the dragon pit. I think it was. And uh, uh, he's like doing that song and, and whatnot. I think they, they definitely made Vermithor look a little bit more like the bronze fury that they yeah. say the, the the name was during the Chaharis's time but we'll see uh, I'm, I'm excited because I think are we getting silver wing this season as well I would say we should be getting silver wing and they haven't said anything about silver wing yeah I'm because I'm curious how silver wing is going to look different from sea smoke we have huh. two kind of grayish dragons. Yeah, yeah. And and it's in well, Sea Smoke should have a little bit more bluish to it, right? Yeah, should um, should, but I feel like when we saw Sea Smoke with Lanor, it wasn't super bluish. And same with like, you know, we've oh. we saw Dreamfire, right? In season one? Yes, a little bit. Yeah. When when Amond is is looking for a dragon. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, I'm curious if they'll show Dreamfire and make her a little more blue purpley maybe we'll see what are your thoughts on now that we're talking about like it'll it'll be okay i'm gonna jump to something different but i'll use dragons still uh we get those dragon eggs right in the trailer the three dragon eggs obviously it's just kind of hinting at daenerys of course like that's like the first thing that comes to mind but I was thinking, what if uh, that whole mo moment of or that shot where we get the three dragon eggs, if it's actually one of Helena's dreams? And because I'm looking forward to seeing more or hearing more of Helena's dreams uh, in House of the Dragon. I love the fact that they made her uh, a dreamer. Um, are you are you do you like that uh, i don't know if we've ever talked about that yeah i think it's funny i think it's good in some regards i think it's a little convenient that they said they're like yeah she sees all these things except she's not going to see blood and cheese and i'm like oh of course she's not going to see that coming so it's a little yeah. convenient but i don't mind it i want to see more of it utilized though because again i feel like helena was yes. one of those characters that they really reserved in the background and i think we need to see her more in the forefront because again we need to see her and really like her and ever be really sympathetic and we already have that a little bit, but I want to see more of her. So I want more of these dragon visions from her. Definitely. Um, I don't know. They there's a lot, really. If you if you really think about it, there is a lot of things that could happen mm -hmm. in season two that we actually don't know, even as book readers. Yeah. Um, and that is that is pretty exciting, uh, in in my opinion. I think it's mm -hmm. it's something uh, if they do it good and they change something, as long as it is good for this story, I think we're going to have fun. And I yeah. think we're we're going to enjoy it. 
So. Oh, for sure. Like as long as it is, I think it's, it's as long as it's utilized successfully and works, like we kind of, I'm bringing it all the way back around where we talked earlier about, um, you know, the Red Priestess Kinvara. And I always mm -hmm. thought that, that was such a dropped plot line. They they show her in yeah. Essos with Danny and then she disappears again. So I just hope that like with, you know, Helena being a dreamer with some of these little new elements they're introducing that weren't in the books, they don't just drop them or they don't sideline them, which, you know, I don't think they will. I think we're in good hands and I'm very hopeful. Um, but yeah, as long as they, you know, do it in a way that's interesting, I'm totally fine with changing things from the book canon because... Again, it's an adaptation. Right. Well, um, I think we've talked about a lot of awesome things. Uh, we probably just could keep going and uh, oh, for sure. But we gotta we gotta save up a little bit more for the next time we get together. And I promise you guys, uh, it will still be uh, sidetracked uh, quite a bit uh, and on our next episodes. But hopefully. The next ones, yeah, we'll we'll go more into like a song of ice and fire because I need to talk to some some of you about these books and what are your thoughts and 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 add more theories to like the ones I already have and and just geek out about this incredible world because I know you love it as well. Um, but yes, uh, if there's anything, do you have? like anything else i know we we got plenty of yeah. more things to say but <laughs> oh yeah we covered a million things we talked and talked and yeah i definitely want to save some more stuff for next time um so i will just say yeah again thank you for having me on your podcast this was really fun we could talk about this for many more hours um but yeah. i will let us end it here um and yeah i'm looking forward to the next time and yeah on your uh current read if you ever want to talk thrones if you ever have any questions or want to bounce theories feel free to message me or you know email me and we'll just do another podcast episode so yes that sounds great and actually it would be really really good um i might just use this platform to uh the one i'm using right now to record to go live um maybe on youtube and uh it says that I can cross stream so maybe we can do some other platform uh hopefully tiktok or, or something like that but uh to talk a song of ice and fire like full-on books uh that would be great really have so many thoughts <laughs> um but no thank you i want to say thank you for for accepting and and joining me here uh i was i've been super excited like i said at the beginning to be able to to uh get together with you and geek out about this incredible world uh and your incredible work really people like literally one of the best cosplayers that i've seen and if you love a song of ice and fire and things like lord of the rings and uh baldur's gate um although of course like you said you uh focus more on a song of ice and fire in the game of thrones universe but yes incredible incredible work in cosplaying uh go follow uh estella graves on TikTok, you're mainly on TikTok, right? That's mainly like your, TikTok. Your yeah, I'm trying to kick off YouTube. We're we're seeing how it goes. So yeah, I, I know you'll do great on YouTube as well, um, Instagram, and you said even probably Twitter. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll like I said at the beginning, I will put all of her social media uh, links on the description or in the description, and uh, if there's anything else uh if not then we will probably call it a night uh well depending on what time you guys are watching uh but yes thank you estella you're awesome i can't wait to keep geeking out about house of the dragon a song of ice and fire uh, especially with season two uh coming up mm -hmm. and if you're down to do a little bit of a rewatch of season one let me know because That'd be a good thing too. Maybe maybe yeah. you'll change a little bit <laughs> on your your opinions of some things and uh, with a rewatch. I don't know. Yeah, maybe you'll yeah. hate it most more. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I, would, I don't want to say hate. Uh, you didn't say hate. I'm sorry. You didn't. You did not say. I did hate, though. But... I was like, I hate season. No, it's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like uh, being. I like being uh, crazy. Anyways, nah, yeah. Thank you for having me on. Uh, this was great, uh, and let's do it again soon. Cool. Awesome. I'll see you all around. And remember, Barar Morghulis. <laughs> <laughs>